ladies and gentlemen, I'd like you to join me in giving a warm University of Sheffield welcome to our guest speaker for this evening, one of the most successful international cricketers to have played for England, Matthew Hoggy Hoggard, MBE. Matthew has given so much to all aspects of cricket. Although currently retired, Hoggy has continued to be involved wherever he can, from commentating to coaching. I am sure he'll go into more detail, but some brief highlights from Hoggy's successful career include playing for and captaining Leicestershire County Cricket Club, along with also playing for his home county of Yorkshire. He was a vital member of the inspirational England side that won the epic 2005 Ashes series and has been a model for consistency throughout his test and one day international career, representing his country on 93 occasions. So welcome, Hoggy. Thank you very much for that very warm welcome. You are not the first university that asked me to come and speak at their awards. I did get a phone call from someone called Emily Wilkes. But when I looked at the history, I thought, well, you lost in 2013, 14, 15 and 16 to the current varsity champions. There was nowhere else I was coming to but to the black and gold. So congratulations to everybody that's been nominated uh, up for an award. It's, it's a great achievement. It's fantastic. I've been sat next to a lot of great people telling me all about the hard work that goes into representing the clubs and getting the clubs up and running. And there's no minor minority clubs at this university, which is fantastic. Um, my story, uh, I started playing cricket when I was 11 and at the age of 17 I hadn't played cricket for Yorkshire at once. I'd gone to all the trials and been overlooked by every age group so I thought my chance of playing cricket had finished and I was going to sixth form college doing my A-levels and playing third team cricket at the age of 18 at my local club Pudsey Cons. And I was playing third team because we didn't have a fourth team. <laughs> and at the age of 18, Phil Carrick, an ex-Yorkshire captain, came to captain the club. And he took one look at me playing third team cricket and said, right, then you're playing first team with me. And Pudsey Kongs were in the Bradford League, which is the strongest league in Yorkshire. And as such, 97% of the players got paid. So from going from third team to first team into a semi-professional club, I absolutely shat myself. <laughs> and I learned a lot for, through playing with Phil Carrick, the ex-Yorkshire captain. He, I'd just gone to finish my, my A-levels that summer, and he said, what are you doing in the winter? And I said, well, I'm going to take a year out, and then I'm going to go to university and study to become a vet. And he said... In that year out, do you fancy going to South Africa? And I thought that'd be a fantastic opportunity to, to go see the world on somebody else's money and um, to learn how to play cricket. So I was sat on the plane uh, down in Heathrow and I thought to myself, what on earth am I doing? Because as an 18-year-old, I still lived at home. I was a little bit wet behind the ears. The furthest I'd ever been away from my parents was Scarborough. I'd never ever been on a plane before in my life. And here I was sat on a plane to go to the murder capital of South Africa. <laughs> it wasn't for the first time I dropped my shopping. But I got to South Africa. And as you do, you always get initiated into your clubs. You always get to find the fun people in the clubs, the, the go-getters in the club. And the club that I was, was no exception. It was called the Pirates club 
and they picked me up for my initiation, which was having a drink in every single establishment around this lake. It was called the Randberg Waterfront. So I thought, being a pom, I'd show them how to drink. I got to the, to the lake and I looked how many restaurants and bars there were, and I thought, <laughs> Quarter of the way around, I went into the toilet and had a TC. Halfway around, it wasn't such a tactical one, but I chundered again. <laughs> Three quarters of the way around, it came out, and finally, as we got all the way around, it went into the lake. I couldn't make it to the toilet. And I thought, thankfully, this was a Friday night, we were playing cricket on Saturday. And I thought, thankfully, that's the end of that, I can go home to bed. And no such luck, we were going to the nightclub. And We'd driven to the waterfront, so I thought we'd just leave our car there and get a taxi. Uh-uh. No such thing as drink driving in them days in South Africa. If you got stopped by the police, you'd give them a 500 rand note and they'd let you off. So we set off driving to the nightclub. When the first set of traffic lights we got to turn from green to red, the car stopped, the driver got out of the car and started running round. The front passenger got out, run round, and the back passenger got out, and Hoggy out of the car and run round. So I'm running round this car thinking, what the freak's happening? As soon as the traffic lights went from red to green, whoever was closest to the driver's door <laughs> had to jump in and drive. Thankfully, I was nowhere near the driver's door because I was absolute comatose. We get to the nightclub. It's Long Island iced tea. It's buy one, get one free. I wake up on the bathroom floor somewhere and then get taken back home. Half past nine in the morning, they pick me back up and we're playing cricket. And half past nine in the morning, it's 20 degrees. I'm struggling. But... It was a life experience. Not only did I learn a lot about myself, being away from my friends and family, being 10,000 miles away in a different country, I played with a lot of great cricketers and I, I learned about cricket. And I came back to Yorkshire. And as I said, in 1996, I made my debut for Yorkshire. In 2000, I played for England. So it's just... <laughs> So in the space of five years, I'd gone from playing third team cricket at a local cricket club to playing for England. And the biggest, the biggest things that changed were I got to know my role within the side. It wasn't just me blindly going off thinking I was doing the right thing. I talked to the captain and the coach and found out what they actually wanted from me. I... Um, I got instilled into me that it was a no-blame culture. Don't blame somebody else for not doing the work when it was up to you. But most of all, to enjoy it. And the other peripheral thing is to get to know your teammates because I, I'm a typical Yorkshireman. I think there's one way of doing it, and that's my way. And when I go into a changing room, I was just thinking that everybody was thinking exactly what I was. And that is not exactly the case. There's always more than one way to skin a, skin a rabbit. There's always one way, more than one way to train. And if you are the sort of person that doesn't like structure, you are going to be different. But again, I won't bore you with that. Um, in 2005, I managed... I was lucky enough to be part of a, an Ashes winging team for the first time. In 19 years, so the cricket itself, the commentators and people that have watched a lot more cricket than I have have said that it is the, one of the best, if not the best series that's ever been played. And as such, there was a lot of pressure because we were still on terrestrial TV. We were on front page, back page, middle pages of all the newspapers. And it just sort of encapsulated the nation. So for eight weeks while we played this Ashes, it was, it was, it was very intense. So you sh 
naturally we celebrated after we'd won it and we won it down in London at the Oval and we won it at six o'clock at night. At half past 11 we were still in the changing rooms drinking piss in our whites. There was a few of us that went out into London still in our whites. We got back to the hotel about quarter past. The ECB, in their wisdom, thought it would be a brilliant idea to put on a breakfast for us and take us around London in an open-top bus. Now, we were a little bit worse for wear when we rocked up for breakfast, but we were suited and booted. The ECB thought, in their wisdom then, that it would be a great idea to put champagne on for breakfast. So we drank a bit of champagne. We go out and we think there's only going to be two men and a dog turn up to see an England cricket team go around London. It was absolutely even. It was so many photographers, press, people were lined up the streets four or five deep, people hanging out of the, the office windows. And we got onto the bus and we set off. Our first stop was Mansion House to meet the Lord Mayor of London at the time, Mr Livingston. To greet us off the bus was the High Sheriff of London. And he was dressed up. He had his black shoes, silver buckle, long socks, dagger, short pants, frilly shirt, gold chain, red jacket, hat, feather sticking out. He looked the dog's dangles. <laughs> We've all come off the bus, shook him by the hand, said, please to meet you, please to meet you, please to meet you. Andrew Flintoff stumbles off the bus, <laughs> knocks him flat on his backside, picks him up, looks him up and down and says, what the fuck have you come at? <laughs> so we push him into the mansion house where there's red wine, white wine, bitter, lager, all the lads that don't mind if we do, start drinking a little bit more. We get put back on the bus, we get taken to Trafalgar Square. Trafalgar Square is absolutely rammed packed. We sing Jerusalem with the 6,000 people in Trafalgar Square. Freddie gives one of the most incoherent interviews I've ever heard played back <laughs> on Sky Sports. And then they put us back on the coach and they take us to 10 Downing Street. We get into 10 Downing Street, straight through 10 Downing Street, into the garden. There's white wine, red wine, bitter lager, don't mind if we do. So we're still carrying on getting pie-eyed. One of the um, bowling fraternity that played in that series decided that he hadn't seen a toilet on the way in. But if you do ever find yourself in the Prime Minister's garden and you can't find it, there's a lovely bank of rhododendrons on the left-hand side. <laughs> That it wasn't me, but it was one of us. And then it was leaving 10 Downing Street that I came into my own. We were leaving the famous black door with the number 10 on it. And behind me was walking the then Prime Minister, Mr. Tony Blair. And across, across from the door, over the other side of the street, was a bank of photographers flashing away. And Tony says, <laughs> I wonder what those want. <laughs> so being a Yorkshireman, I told him. I said, they want a photo, you knob. <laughs> Everybody was thinking it, it just took a Yorkshireman to tell him. And then we get back on the bus, finally we were going back to the hotel. And then Andrew Flintoff made the biggest mistake. Schoolboy error, he hasn't been asleep for 36 hours, he thought it'd be a fantastic opportunity to go to sleep. Steve Armisen says, right then, that twat's having it. <laughs> He's been at me all year. And he walked to the front of the bus, and because it was quite a high profile series, there was a lot of memorabilia kicking about. To sign memorabilia, you need permanent markers. Fr Army goes to the front of the bus, picks up a permanent marker, goes over to the sleeping Andrew Flintoff, and he puts C-U-N-T on his forehead. 
He puts TWAT down his left cheek. He gave him a moustache and he gave him a beard. He went the whole works. There's actual video footage of Andrew Flintoff getting off the bus at the hotel with his jacket firmly over his head. Everybody thought he had just had enough of being lime, in the limelight, but I knew it's because his face was full of expletives. <laughs> he was on breakfast TV the following morning at 8 o'clock. His face is red raw. <laughs> he explains it away by having a cold shower to wake himself up in the morning. I know it was his agent, Neil Fairbrother, and a gallon of turps that scrubbed <laughs> his face clean. But 2005, it was epic. It was, it's, it was the, my favourite series of all time. And it set us up for a lot of things that people have gone on to do. Well, Freddie's gone on to have a very good cricket, um, TV career. Michael Vaughan uh, is on the TV a lot and doing Strictly. My claim to fame was I got onto Celebrity MasterChef. <laughs> And I got through to the quarter-finals. And as such, I think I'm a pretty good cook. So when I walked into the kitchen last month and saw my wife, Sarah, watching Gordon Ramsay on the TV, I said to her, why on earth are you watching a cookery programme for? You can't cook. As quick as a flash, she turned round to me and said, well, you watch porn? <laughs> People ask me what's the best sledge I've ever had on a cricket pitch. I said, nothing can take that away from Sarah. That's the best sledge. I have ever had. Now, I'm very aware that there is shed loads of awards to hand out, and there's a very good nightclub, apparently, that we're all going to get trolled at later. So I won't take any more of your time, but stand up, have a drink for varsity champions, and go black and gold.